Welcome friends to this uh, new lecture of soil science and technology and uh, in this lecture uh, we will be covering the two important plant nutrients, macronutrients these are soil phosphorus and potassium and uh, so the concepts which we will cover in this lecture are basically phosphorus and its available forms and then fixation of phosphorus, then potassium and its available forms and then fixation of potassium and then phosphorus and potassium fertility management. So, let us start with the phosphorus you know that phosphorus is very important for plant growth it is because it is an essential component of ATP, DNA, RNA and phospholipids and phosphorus is found in very limited amount in soil and uh, there are several problems with phosphorus we will discuss them later on. But it is uh, found in very limited quantity in soil and majority of them is also held in non-available form. So, phosphorus present a major problem. So, whatever amount of phosphorus is present majority of those fraction uh, majority of that uh, phosphorus is basically you know fixed by different uh, f different different chemicals which are present into the soil. So, most of the available phosphorus are inaccessible to the plant. So, uh, deficiency of phosphorus also uh, very important and because of this fixation process and the deficiency of phosphorus causes stunted growth, bluish green leaf and delayed maturity. As you can see in this picture, it is showing the stunted growth and as well as the bluish green leaves and you know sometime reddish in color and also sometime delayed in maturity. So, these are the important deficiency symptoms of phosphorus. Now, also highly weather warm and humid regions have major phosphorus deficiency because uh, you know uh, we will see what are the reason behind, but just remember that in this region there is a high amount of uh, different aluminum and iron bearing minerals. So, this aluminum and iron basically fix this phosphorus in these conditions. So, creating phosphorus deficiency. So, if we take a look in the phosphorus cycle it is very important. Now, this, uh, this is the phosphorus cycle. So, let us start with the plant tissue. So, when the plant uh, dies ultimately you know uh, and also the leaves it ultimately goes to the soil uh, organisms and uh, you know and you know plant animal and human wastes and also you know wastes are from animal is coming waste from human is coming so from there obviously it will be converted into soil organic biomass from soil organic biomass there will be soluble organic phosphorus and also insoluble ester bonded organic phosphorus so these three soil organic uh, organisms biomass soluble organic phosphorus uh, and insoluble ester bounded organic phosphorus basically compose this organic forms of phosphorus in the soil and also the soil organism biomass soluble organic P and this insoluble ester bounded to organic P are interchangeable among themselves. So, and from this insoluble ester also the you know phosphorus can move to the soil organic biomass. So, uh, you know this soil organic biomass again. Uh, mineralized to form uh, different uh, inorganic forms of phosphorus which comes into the soil solution. So, this is a mineralization process we have already discussed the mineralization process while discussing the nitrogen and the opposite process is obviously immobilization where you can see that inorganic forms of phosphorus are being immobilized in the organic form. And also soluble or from a soluble organic uh, phosphorus forms also they can come into the directly soil solution. So, this is one way and finally, you can see soil solution from soil solution there are some losses by leaching and obviously, those fraction which are present in the soil solution will be available for the plants uh, you know to uptake by root or different types of mycorrhizae. What are the mycorrhizae we will discuss later on and also uh, there are some deposition through dust and also if we can apply the phosphatic fertilizer through phosphate rocks and other chemicals they directly uh, helps in uh, you know building this inorganic phosphorus in the soil solution. So, directly you can see here they are a fraction of it coming directly into the soil solution however, a major fraction is getting uh, you know getting you know fixed by different chemicals. So, you can see a major fraction is coming in this way and, and there are some 
readily soluble calcium phosphate and obviously there are some very slowly soluble calcium phosphate minerals. So, basically in a calcareous soil or in alkaline soil these phosphorus are fixed as calcium phosphate this is one of the major form and in uh, and dominant forms of inorganic phosphorus in acidic highly weathered soils are basically iron aluminum uh, phosphate. So, in this case phosphorus sorbed in clay and iron aluminum oxide surface just like here and also phosphorus occluded in iron aluminum minerals which are extremely insoluble. So, these are basically inorganic forms of phosphorus you can see basically the inorganic forms of phosphorus are either iron or aluminum uh, bounded phosphorus or the calcium bounded phosphorus. So, dominant forms are basically changes depending on the soil pH. So, in acidic soil these iron aluminum phosphate are predominant however, as in case of uh, in case of calcareous soil this calcium phosphate is predominant. However, from this sorbed phosphorus in clay and iron al oxides al aluminum oxides minimum, there are some desorption occurs and as a result of desorption this basically goes to the soil solution. An opposite reaction opposite uh, conversion is also happened when the soil solution H 2 P O 4 and H P O 4 get adsorbed in this P uh, in this uh, clay and iron aluminum oxide surface and ultimately get uh, you know inaccessible to the plants creating deficiency. So, phosphorus is very low in soil solution and very immobile remember that this phosphorus is all very low and it has very slow diffusion to root surfaces whatever root is there. So, very slow diffusion is there. We require symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi to extract phosphorus from areas normally inaccessible to plant roots thereby supplying phosphorus we will discuss that later on. And unlike nitrogen not usually lost from the soil in gaseous form we know that and also you know soil you know, loss of phosphorus occurs to basically erosion leaching and plant uptake and for efficient pea uptake of crops satisfying the phosphorus fixed phosphorus capacity of soil should be considered while fertilizer management. So, th the fixation of phosphorus is very much important while considering the phosphorus management. So, this is the phosphorus cycle in a nutshell. So, let us go ahead and see what are the different forms of phosphorus again. Obviously, in organic phosphorus are basically present as monoesters or inositol phosphate examples are phytic acids and they are most common in you know they are the most common organic forms of phosphorus. Apart from that phosphorus is present in phospholipid diesters like nucleic acids and uh, sorry phosphate diesters like nucleic acids and finally, they are also present in phospholipids and uh, you know type of phosphate present depends on the obviously soil types you can see here the phosphorus content in different soils varies based on the soil type because in molly soil you can see organic phosphorus concentration is higher at the surface however it is layer uh, at the you know at the depth of the, at the, at the uh, you know in the subsoil whereas in case of ulti soil uh, and alpha aridy soil the comparatively less amount of organic uh, phosphorus is present at the surface soil and you know also it get depleted in the sur you know subsurface soil. And uh, inorganic phosphorus content increases as we go to the lower depth especially in case of molly soil and aridy soils. So, you can see based on the uh, type of soil present they are also changing. I mean the concentration of organic phosphorus and inorganic phosphorus changes with depth. So, organic phosphorus basically undergoes mineralization and immobilization. You can see here organic phosphorus forms basically they are also uh, you know converted to H 2 P O 4 which is a soluble phosphate and this is available form of phosphate and uh, you know these basically conversion of organic phosphate to uh, inorganic phosphate that it is called the mineralization process we know that and this mineralization process again mediated by different microbes. And uh, once this H 2 P O 4 is formed they are getting fixed by either iron either uh, aluminum or calcium to form this iron aluminum and calcium phosphate which are basically insoluble and fixed phosphate. And opposite of the mineralization is immobilization where the some fraction of these fixed phosphates or you know inorganic soluble phosphates are converted into organic P forms. So, organic P is the major supplier of phosphorus in highly weathered soil. So, let us move ahead and see what are the different chemical fractions. 
obviously the inorganic phosphates are very immobile in nature and calcium phosphates are the dominant p supplying in highly alkaline soil we know that and iron aluminum phosphates are dominant in acid soil and phosphorus get fixed in the soil and the you know the, the longer we you know we keep the phosphate the phosphatic fertilizer or phosphorus into the soil it will get fixed so you can see here it is the direct relation between the soil ph and distribution and you can see as the soil ph goes towards the alkaline range obviously fixation mostly as cal calcium phosphates and in the acidic range fixation is mainly by hydrous oxides of iron and iron manganese and aluminum and some fraction in the extreme acid condition you can see there are some chemical fixation by soluble iron aluminum and, magne and uh, manganese and relatively available phosphorus you can see here at the ph range of 6 to 7 uh, so this is the optimum range of phosphorus uh, you know phosphorus uh, availability so you know more precisely it is 6.5 to around 7.5 you can say so uh, these are different uh, chemical fractions uh, which are present uh, as inorganic uh, phosphate forms so uh, so let us move ahead and see uh, what is the influence of pH on different forms of phosphorus? Obviously, as we have seen that uh, in the lower pH range, obviously phosphorus will be mainly present as phosphoric acid uh, form. Whereas, in case of high alkaline condition, in alkaline condition, it will present as divalent condition. And in the pH, that is in available range, starting from six to seven, around six to seven, it will be present in H two PO four minus. So it is a uh, it is a uh, it is an H two PO four form, and this is an H PO four two minus form. And at at pH seven point around I, I would say seven to seven point five, these H two PO four and H PO four are almost in uh, you know equilibrium condition, almost present in equilibrium condition. So this is the primary orthophosphate, and this is the secondary orthophosphate, and and those are uh, you know available to the plants. So. Uh, so, let us see what are the different mechanisms of phosphorus fixation. So, one of the mechanism is precipitation reaction and as you can see here this aluminum you know this basically fixation occurs especially in one is to one type of clays dissolved ions are precipitated. So, here the dissolved aluminum and you can see it is a you know phosphoric group and ultimately uh, you know the protons are formed here and this are uh, this chemical uh, is getting uh, you know pretty precipitated so it is an one of the way of phosphorus fixation another way of phosphorus fixation is uh, you can see here is the clay silicon aluminum and in the clay age you know that these hydroxyl groups are there and these hydroxyl groups are basically you know uh, due to the negative due to the positive charge development due to pH dependent charge or variable charge they attract this negative charge uh, sulphate and you can see this is a primary orthophosphate ion this primary orthophosphate ion basically exchange with this sulphate. So, bringing the sulphates to the soil solution and you can see here there is a formation of anion exchange reaction the anion exchange outer sphere complex. So, this is an outer sphere complex. The third way is the formation of inner sphere complex by reaction with aluminum and iron oxide surface. So, you can see here again this is an uh, you know clay age and obviously hydro or, or sorry hydrox oxide surface and obviously there are hydroxyls and you know these H 2 PO 4 or primary orthophosphate ion is here and ultimately you can see these hydroxyl and one you know and, and these hydroxyl OH 2 and 1 H from here released as a form you know as uh, you know water ultimately forming this compound and the second step there is a formation of binuclear stable binuclear bridge which is an inner sphere complex. So, basically in the stable binuclear phase there again um, you know there is a release of water ultimately it is a binuclear bridge you can see. So, this is another forms of fixation. So, for the P for replaces the structural hydroxyl ions and forms an inner sphere complex and this P is very tightly bound and availability is very very low and finally, the phosphate becomes an integral part of oxide minerals and this P is relatively unavailable in this case. 
So, now you have idea about the different mechanism of phosphate fixation. So, let us go ahead and see what are the different factors which affects the phosphate fixation. Obviously, the amount of clay present, the more the clay present, more the phosphate fixation and less release of phosphorus to the plant. Types of clay present, obviously, the most phosphorus fixation we will see in case of amorphous iron, aluminum, manganese oxide and the clay minerals like allophane. And obviously, the least fixation you will get in the 2 is to 1 type of clay. So, you can see a series of different minerals and you know their relative orders in which they can fix phosphate. And also, pH imp very important because greatest fixation occurs at pH extremes and lower fixation occurs at pH 6 to 7 which are optimum pH which is the optimum pH range. And amount of organic matter obviously, the organic matter reduces phosphorus fixation because the different types of organic acids which releases due to the organic matter or decomposition, they can replace these fixed ox, uh, phosphates from different uh, iron, aluminum and calcium phosphates. So, these are some benefits of organic matter and these are some factors which affect phosphorus fixation. Now, let us see what is mycorrhizae. Now, mycorrhizae is basically a uh, symbiotic relationship between fungus and root of certain plants. Now, that is why it is another name is myco, myco stems comes from the myco, you know fungus and rhizi means root. So, it is basically symbiotic relationship between fungus and roots and they are mutually benefit as symbiosis is uh, you know as there is a symbiosis because carbohydrates uh, you know you know plant you know fungus get carbohydrates from the plants and also plant. Uh, and plant get phosphorus, zinc and copper, water and nitrogen uh, from the uh, fungus, how we will see. And there are diff two different types of um, you know uh, mycorrhizae, one is called the endomycorrhizae and an ectomycorrhizae and end among the endomycorrhizae very important one is vesicular, arbuscular mycorrhizae or VA mycorrhizae or in short it is called VAM. And other type of mycorrhizae are ericoid mycorrhizae, orchid endo you know orchid endomycorrhizae. Uh, so on so forth, but these two are major are you know and very very important. First of all, the vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae and you know ectomycorrhizae. We'll we'll cons we'll discuss them. Now, vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae, the short form is VAM, and you can see here in the inside root. Obviously, uh, they can form different types of intra uh, intercellular mycelium. So this is a uh, you know. Ex this is basically external mycelium and you can see these are internal mycelium. So, they are any basically penetrating within the cell and they are intercellular myce mycelium and then intra you know uh, intracellular arbuscules. So, these are arbuscules and basically you know tree like hostodiums used for nutrient swapping between the plant cell and the mycorrhizae uh, and the mycorrhizae and, uh, and between the fungus and obviously, these are some structures we call them vesicles which uh, contains basically the reserves and outside the root you will see some uh, you know spores which are basically multinucleate uh, basically they are reproductive chlamydospores and also hyphae you can see here these are these, these are basically thick runners and filamentous hyphae and these basically the outer sphere and inner you know in a, in a inside root and outside root they basically forms an extensive network of hyphae even connecting different plants so this is a this is the this is what we call vam or uh, vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizae now some example you know some photographs of vam as you can see this is an arbuscules of glomus species where you can see extensive branching provides large amount of surface area through which nutrients can be exchanged and also this is an outside root network of hyphae and spores you can see how intricate network of this hyphae and spores can be developed through this mycorrhizal association so uh, another important mycorrhizae is ectomycorrhiza or EM and this ectomycorrhiza you can see inside root I mean uh, the name suggests that they are outside basically present in uh, outside and you can see inside root they are basically forms intracellular hyphae and they, they do not enter into the soil just like the VAM or endomycorrhizae did because they form these uh, arbuscules within the cell. However, they only form this intracellular hyphae and this intracellular hyphae called net like structure you know forms this net like structure we call it hearting net. 
an outside root you can see thick layer of hyphae around the root and they are calling the fungal sheath and these lateral roots become stunted and this is you can see this is the fungal sheath obviously. Hyphae also mass about equal to roots mass so form extensive network of hyphae even connecting different plants. So, this is an extomycorrhizal fungi. So, why we need mycorrhiza? Well, you can see here the roots and root hairs cannot enter into the smallest spore for extraction of the nutrients, especially in uh, and this is very much important. So, uh, uh, and, and, and this extraction is very much important in nutrient uh, limited conditions, especially where the nutrient is deficient or nutrient is fixed. So, you need some mechanism to extract those nutrients from some smaller pores. Now, the mycorrhizal fungi are one tenth of diameter of the root hair. So, they can easily penetrate into the into different into very small uh, you know uh, pockets and they have increased surface area. So, they can easily extract the nutrients from different pockets or different places where the roots are basically cannot uh, access. So, that is why we need mycorrhizal association especially in nutrient rich environment. So, how we can enhance the phosphorus availability to the plant? Now, enhancing mycorrhizal symbiosis by crop rotation and minimum tillage is one of the way to enhance the phosphorus ability, phosphorus availability and also growing phosphorus efficient plants which can with withstand low amount of phosphorus and also phosphorus application to overcome the P fixation capacity of the soil localized placement of the soil you can see band placement of phosphorus is you know is done uh, basically they are placed in bands around the root of the plant around the or around the plant uh, so that the phosphorus has not you know you know if the less amount of reactive surface of clay is available for the phosphorus so that's why you know the bland placement for phosphorus is recommended and also using organic matter from P, P efficient crop as mulch and also use the phosphorus efficient cropper crops and maintaining pH 6 to 7 by liming and acidification are some examples by which you can enhance the phosphorus availability. Now, let us start with the potassium. Unlike nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium remains in cell solution rather than as component. Now, it is enzyme activator and responsible for maintaining osmo osmotic potential. Remember, phosphorus is taken up by the plant as K plus. I am sorry, potassium is taken up by the plant as K plus. Now, potassium increases the hardiness of the plant and makes it more resistant to insect, pest and diseases and environmental stress. And remember, a balance should be maintained between potassium and other nutrients. So, basically it is involved in different types of activation of enzymes. Now, deficiency of potassium is important because it can be easily identified by chlorosis on leafage. So, you can see here and also white necrotic spot may also appear. So, you can see here necrotic margin in brinjal and obviously white necrotic spots you can see here in alpha alpha and also chlorotic margin in soybean. So, all these are deficiency symptoms of potassium. So, what is the potassium cycle? So, you can see here this is a potassium cycle obviously, the plant is the you know uh, plant is there over the surface and when the plants and different types of animal residues goes as a you know, you know generative you know builds up, they goes through leaching and decomposition and ultimately produces the biomass. From this biomass soil solution phosphate soil solution potassium uh, basically came which is uh, which is present in only 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 percent and from there you can see exchangeable form which is 1 to 2 percent and fixed in 2 is to 1 type of clays that is non exchangeable 1 to 10 percent and finally, micas and other uh, you know elements are present which are 90 to 98 percent. So, this exchangeable fixed and you know mineral forms of uh, phosphate get easily uh, you know easily removed through erosion and uh, for you know potassium which is present in soil solution get lost by runoff. So, plant basically takes up the potassium from this uh, solution which contains 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 percent and also we add different types of phosphatic fertilizer like MOP, SOP we will discuss that 
later on and these basically generates the potassium in the soil solution. Sometime this uh, solution fee also get re, you know lost by leaching process and conversion of solution to exchangeable and exchangeable to non exchangeable and non exchangeable to primary mineral fix are basically reversible processes and when the solution phosphate uh, solution potassium is getting depleted sometime this uh, uh, non exchangeable uh, forms of potassium get to the solution and then sometime this uh, you know uh, mineral or you know mineral primary mineral fix potassium goes to the soil solution, but soil solution to replenish that but the process is very very slow so, what are the problems in potassium management? Well, through potassium is found in positively large amount, you know, uh, the, you know, the po potassium is uh, present in large amount in, uh, uh, in the soil. However, its plant available form is very, you know, relatively low because it readily lost by leaching. So, liming helps in reducing leaching in potassium. Why? Because you can see here there are two types of soil, one in acid soil and lime soil. So, liming helps in fixation of potassium because calcium ion are easily exchangeable with potassium uh, instead of aluminum in otherwise acid soil. So, in aluminum in acid soil obviously the exchangeable sites or exchange uh, complex will be saturated by aluminum so, and in case of alkaline soil the exchange complex will be saturated by calcium, but calcium can easily can can be easily replaced by potassium so thereby it get fixed however aluminum cannot be easily replaced by potassium so that's why liming helps in uh, reducing the phosphate uh, potassium uh, you know leaching so what is the luxury consumption of potassium luxury consumption is when the potassium is present in excess amount of in soil and plant consumes more potassium than needed and that is called the luxury consumption of k so, you can see here uh, this is a relationship between potassium available to the plant and potassium content of plants and this is the in the secondary y axis is the relative plant growth or yield. So, you can see as we are increasing the potassium available, available potassium in the soil and potassium content of the plant is getting increased obviously in this direction. However, this line basically shows the potassium required for optimal growth. So, above which all these are basically luxury consumption which are basically not needed. So, similarly you can see the plant will respond to the added potassium up to this level and after that you know the rate of increase will decrease and ultimately it will reach a plateau where there is no further relative growth of the plant. So, this is called, this is, this is called the luxury consumption of potassium. So, what are the different forms of potassium? We have already seen four major forms of potassium are uh, found in the soil. Potassium in primary minerals which are unavailable to very very slowly available. Then secondly non exchangeable potassium in secondary minerals which are also slowly available. Then third is the exchangeable potassium on soil colloids then potassium soluble in water and these two are readily soluble in uh, for plants and the two readily available forms are in equilibrium with each other. So, obviously, non exchangeable potassium to exchangeable potassium conversion process and its reverse process is very slow. However, the conversion of exchangeable form to soil solution potassium and its reverse process is fairly rapid. So, what are the factors which affects potassium fixation in the soil? Type of clay and moisture is very, very important. So, 2 is to 1 type of clay have more potassium fixation capacity than 1 is to 1 type of clay. And secondly, pH as you know that pH uh, you know liming increases the pota uh, potassium fixation and alternate wetting and drying and freezing and thawing you know during our uh, clay mineralogy uh, discussion we have discussed that how due to how this potassium are get, getting fixed in the interlaced space of mica and from this mica or fine grade mica or illite how due to different types of weathering process these interlayer potassium get replaced by magnesium and ultimately produce the magne ultimately produce the vermiculite. So, uh, this is how and this conversion of uh, mica to vermiculite basically mediated through alternative wetting and drying process or freezing and thawing uh, process. So, that is being shown here. So, uh, 
also it is the last slide. So, managing potassium fertility obviously is the fit frequent light application may reduce the luxury consumption of potassium and also liming helps in overcoming the leaching losses of potassium. Well weathered soil provides a good native potassium availability and finally, while harvesting the forage crops residue should be returned back into the field. So, that there is a continuous supply of potassium. So, obviously, these are uh, four different ways of inputs of potassium obviously plant residues and animal excretions. Um, you know atmospheric depositions, fertilizers, slowly available potassium minerals, whereas the losses are fixation, erosion losses and then leaching losses and plant removal. Obviously, this fixation also goes to slowly available potassium minerals because they are in turn uh, also very slowly available to uh, and ultimately uh, helps in building the potassium concentration in the soil solution. So, guys we have finished this uh, lecture and this references again the nature and properties of soil by Nilesi Brady and Will and uh, I hope that you have learned something new in this lecture about potassium and phosphorus and uh, let us stop here and we will start fertilizer in our next lecture. Thank you.